diagram for Pasco. This diagram is something that you see very often and you should get quite familiar with how to identify the various plants. This is just a cartoon version. We may provide you a, an image of a real Pinot Corpasco. For example, this one here is a zoomed up version. If we were to provide you this, are you able to identify the various layers? All the various la layers of the fission? Can you? Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Uh, first and foremost, when we look at the Reno Corpasco, There are probably two different things that are taking place. Number one, you need barriers of filtration. And number two, you need some you need to be able to maintain hydrostatic pressure. So that we can constantly create a new filtrate. And broadly speaking, therefore the function of Urino Corpasco is our scar filtration. Okay. You are expected to know four different layers of filtration. The first layer, okay, so there are four layers. See how many you can remember. Okay, first layer, we start off from the Glomerulus. First one, fenestrated glomerular capillary. Okay, sorry, I should put capillary. Okay, the glomerulus has many, many pores. That's what allows the filtrate to pass through. First layer of filter. Second layer of filter, if we go uh, from in this direction out, what will be the next one? Overlooking. Okay. Basolaminar or basement membrane. After which, then we have those funny looking cells. Okay. So, photocytes. But the photocytes form filtration slits. So, often you can write filtration slits form by interlocking pedicels of photocytes. And last but not least, in between all the pedicels, they are interlocking, we have one more layer of membrane. And that membrane is called the slip membrane. So these four layers combined together, very important, so they allow you to filter small things. Small things will pass through but not the big ones. So what can pass through? Small solutes will pass through. Whereas the big ones will not. And I'll give you some examples. For example, your red blood cells as well as proteins. Okay. Large proteins, red blood cells typically don't pass through. And therefore, this is a very good sign uh, that doctors use to find out if your renal corpuscle is damaged. If there's blood in your pee, we know that there's some sort of damage in these filters. If your pee looks very foamy, it means that there's a lot of protein inside your urine. Okay, so these are all signs. Constantly force new filtrate through. 
And in order to do so, there is a difference in size of the arterioles going in and out of the glomerulus. So the adaptation here is that the efferent arteriole has a smaller diameter lumen compared to the apron arterial. And this is another skill to pick up. If we were to provide you an image showing one arterial going in, one going out, are you able to tell which one is apron, which one is efferent? For example, If I flip this entire renal vascular another way, it will look like it's on top and below. So never use top, below, left, right as a, is it, uh, to help you decide whether it's the apron or apron. Always look at the sides. Okay, so these are the adaptations of the renal vascular. This is the first part, which is very important, because if we fail to filter, then we, the kidneys fail to serve their function. Today's lesson, we are going to dive into another part, function of our renal, of our nephron. And that function is selective reabsorption. Because you realise that the small things that pass through are a mixture of good and bad. We have the things we want to pee out. For example, if we have excess water that we need to pee out, that's what we want to pee out. We also want to pee out all our waste products like urea. But then there's a lot of good stuff entering our filtrate, like glucose and amino acids. All of these are good stuff, yet it enters our filtrate because they are too small. The filters aren't able to capture them. And that's why we need to understand the second part of the lesson, selective reabsorption. I say selective because we are selectively taking back the good stuff. We leave the bad stuff out as you win. So in today's lesson, we're going to focus on that. We're going to look at all the various parts of the nephron. We're going to look at how they are adapted to reabsorb the useful stuff. And also, with this knowledge, you can also tell the health of your urine. Because if your nephrons fail to reabsorb the good stuff, then we can tell that it's failing. For this part of the lesson, I'll need you to do your work. We go to part three. Okay, let's work together. In your textbook, may I get you to open your notes? And look at page 8 to 10 of your notes. In page 8 to 10 of your notes, it will show you the various parts of the nephron. Your task today as we work together is to identify the function, what are the transport processes involved in reabsorption, and also what the adaptations are. Then we work together to craft a summary table as a class. This is what your summary table should look like at the end of the day. We have the proximal convoluted tubule, the first part. Then we have the loop of Henle. Then we have the distal convoluted tubule. Finally, we have the collecting duct. You should be able to craft a very succinct table that summarizes the various functions and adaptations. All you need to all you need to know will fit into one table. So first and foremost, function. Meaning what? is this part of the nephron reabsorbing. Okay. Next part of the table, you can look at the transport processes. For example, if it's reabsorbing water, it should be using osmosis as the transport process. Last but not least, 
adaptation. How is this part adapted so that it can carry out this transport process? For example, if he wants to carry out osmosis, you should expect to find a lot of aquaporins in this region of the nephron. Okay, so you should be able to summarize it into three columns. But we work together today. Let's see how much we can capture as a class from page 8 to 10. I'd like you to fill in each uh, row, each column, and then we will crowd the table together as a class to summarize this part of the chapter.
step faster, you can go to a practice room for reps to build up your height.
uh, slowly ease into the various adaptations for the various parts of the network. I'm going to go first with the function of each part. Okay, for yourself, you should also be able to scan through your friend's work. Okay, la.
And this membrane protein may be co-transporting two different things at one go. Okay, that's what co-transport means. Co means together. Transport means to transport. Co-transport. Okay, so these are all the processes involved. So how might this region of the nephron be adapted then? Okay, so we come to the adaptations. Many of you in the adaptations for the PCT, I think it's quite straightforward. For example, ring road, and there should be numerous microvilli. Okay, the microvilli increase the surface area for reabsorption. As we scroll down, we see that some of your friends also wrote that there are lots of mitochondria. Okay, indeed, you should have a lot of mitochondria. For what? We learned that mitochondria carry out cellular respiration uh, for, so that we have ATP for active transport. Last but not least, it should also be adapted to, to have a lot of membrane transport proteins. We need all these membrane transport proteins to carry out both transport, facilitated diffusion. Right? You also expect, for example, to have aquaporins present so that you can reabsorb all of the water via osmosis. So here's an example of one row describing the function of the nephron, the transport processes involved, as well as the adaptations. You'll find that therefore, this part of the chapter is very linked to your James 3 topic, transport across membranes. Okay, so I'll just draw a line across. We can cut off here, and we'll move on to the next section of the nephron, which is the loop of Henley. of the loop of Henle be? Let's look around. Santos says loop of Henle is where more water and solids are reabsorbed. Okay, if we scroll down, many of your friends say the same thing. It's where most, more water is reabsorbed. Christine adds on that where is the water reabsorbed to? It's reabsorbed to the vasa recta, which is the blood capillaries that are right beside it. Okay, so as we scroll down, most of us mention water and more solutes. Okay, so that is what we are reabsorbing. So we absorb more water. We also reabsorb more solutes. In this section, uh, these solutes are primarily salts. Because a lot of the solutes, such as glucose and amino acids, have already been reabsorbed fully. Remember, we want to take back all the useful stuff. So actually in the loop of Henle, mainly the solutes that are left are the salts, not so much the sugars and the amino acids. Okay, we look at key phase point. Uh, when Ife describes what is being reabsorbed, for example at the PCT, she goes to great detail, reabsorb amino acid, glucose, fructose, and all these salts, uh, ions. Okay, we do not need you to go through that then. Okay, so uh, don't uh, waste your memory space on all these details. But broadly speaking, you should know the, the more important ones, like glucose, amino acids. You can just lump it together as salts and ions. Okay, don't need to, you to know all the fine, fine examples. For example, Shanice also gave a lot of examples here. It's uh, good to know, but don't need you to memorize. You can lump them together as salts and ions. Okay, so that's at the loop of LA. How might, what kind of processes may be involved? Well, if we are reabsorbing water, again, you expect that osmosis is the primary means to reabsorb. If you are reabsorbing salts, you find that there is a slight difference um, of the processes being used. Facilitated diffusion. 
as well as active transport is being used. Any other processes you all mentioned? Okay, that's probably all the processes you all mentioned. Huh? I think co-transport is also something that is mentioned again. So how might it be adapted? Okay, can we just differentiate a little bit? When we look at the loop of Penley, there is the ascending and the descending, right? Um, but each section absorbs different things. Okay, we expect you to know that difference. So which one absorbs which? At the ascending, sorry, at the descending, when it first goes down, what is being reabsorbed then? Water, primarily water, not so much salt. So you want to take that men make that mental note up. For osmosis, this is for the descending. Okay, then when you go up the ascending is when you reabsorb all of your salts. So this is for the ascending. Okay, we expect you to know the, the difference in the function. When it descends, it's primarily water reabsorbed. When it ascends, it's primarily salts that are being reabsorbed. Adaptation. So how might you describe the adaptations for this part of the nephron? Okay, let's look around. Uh, look for Penley. Many of you mentioned the adaptations as being thick or thin. Okay. Uh, a lot of you mentioned thickness or thinness. Okay, but how does that relate to the absorption process? Let us perhaps look at uh, Wani's answer. Wani mentioned that at the ascending loop of Penley, it is Thin. It has thin and thick segments, which are not permeable to water but permeable to solutes. Okay, so how might you describe the adaptation? This is describing more of its function. You can describe your its adaptations this way. Therefore, if at the descending loop of Penle osmosis is taking place, you expect to find lots of aquaporins here. Lots of aquaporins present. For the ascending loop of Penle, you expect to find lots of other membrane transport proteins. For salts and ions. But you won't expect to find any aquaporins. No aquaporins. Okay, so this is what the adaptations are. Part. What is the function of the distal convoluted tubule in collecting dust? Okay, we see that many of our friends 
wrote something along these lines. Serene says, reabsorption of water and solutes are fine regulated. So it is variable depending on your body's needs. Depending on what your body's needs, we vary what we want, how much we want to reabsorb. Kylie says, reabsorption of water and solutes are fine regulated for homeostasis. Reabsorption of water and solutes are fine regulated for homeostasis, says Mia. For this very last part, Think of the distal cumulative and collecting duct as regions where it's the only part where we can vary how much we want to reabsorb. So, here, what you would want to write would be fine regulation of reabsorption of solutes and water. Same, same for both. This is where we want to find regulate. I like the word for homeostasis because that's what we're really doing. If we need more salts of water in our blood, then we reabsorb more here. If we need less, then we reabsorb less. These two regions are the regions where we can control. How do we control is the, uh, it's actually something we've learned before. the processes being used, what could they be? Again, you expect processes like osmosis being used for reabsorption of water. You also find all these same processes being found here too. Okay, every time you want to reabsorb solute salts, all these same processes are used. Right? Facilitator, diffusion, co-transport, active transport, Watch this video before. This is probably our third time watching. Yeah. Yes, this is the lost at sea one. But you, this guy is still lost at sea. Yeah. Okay, so we learned this. We watch this video once in homeostasis. We watch it another time in endocrine system. Okay, and this is the last time you should be watching this. Uh, but it ties into this last part. So this is this part we expect you to know. Is related to homeostasis, and the process involved here is called small regulation, where we regulate the amount of water we absorb. And you've heard of all these hormones before, because we've watched this video a few times already. But we just watch it one more time, because now it really ties into this chapter. So the first time we watch is a case study for homeostasis, second time we watch is a case study for hormones. This last time we watch it, we link it to this chapter. Imagine you lost at sea and really dehydrated. Water levels in the blood decreases, and this makes the blood more concentrated in solutes. In other words, the osmolarity of your blood increases. This is detected by receptors in the hypothalamus. These receptors are called osmoreceptors. 
When the OSMO receptors detect an increase in blood osmolarity, it sends more nerve signals to the pituitary gland. This results in more antidiuretic hormone to be secreted into the blood. The secreted antidiuretic hormone then travels to the kidneys where the nephrons are. Nephrons in the kidney filter waste products, salts, and water out of the blood. The last part of the nephron, called the collecting duct, is where water reabsorption is regulated. Antidiuretic hormone receptors are located on the walls of the collecting duct. When antidiuretic hormone binds to the receptors, it causes a cascade of reactions in the cells. The vesicles contain apoporins, which are membrane protein channels that allow osmosis to occur, will be inserted into the walls of the collecting duct. More water can now be reabsorbed from the filtrate into the blood at the collecting duct. And as a result, the filtrate and eventually the urine becomes more concentrated and lesser in volume. In addition, because there is now more water in your bloodstream, the blood osmolarity decreases back to its normal range. Unfortunately, we're still stuck at sea. Okay, so that concludes this uh, big chunk of the of your learning adaptations of the nephron. Uh, you're expected to know what is absorbed at each stage the transport processor, last but not least, how it's adapted. Give an example of a question. If you go to practice makes programs, you go to this particular question, they show you a cross section of one part of the nephron. And then they ask you, can you tell which part of the nephron this is? Can you tell? If you were to zoom in to this diagram, does it provide you a clue?
not really a good answer because it implies that at Y and at Z, which is a loop of Henle and a collecting dark and DCT, that there's still glucose present. It shouldn't be. If this could be if you have unhealthy nephrons. Let's say your nephrons are damaged and it is unable to carry out its function anymore. Then uh, actually this is a sign that your nephrons are spurred. You end up seeing lots of glucose inside your pee, lots of amino acids inside your pee, lots of salts inside your pee. That's why every time people go for health checkup, you actually pee into a cup. Because it's that if the pee inside the cup, okay, students always walk past in the most awkward time. Okay, if the pee inside the cup contains a lot of glucose, amino acids, and salts, that means uh, your nephrons aren't reabsorbing the good stuff. It's just letting it go. Uh, now that you have this information, I mean, I go for health checkup, you get the checkup back, and then they show you urine, and then they show you all the components inside. This is something you want to look out for. You see glucose inside, uh, actually, your doctor may tell you that you may have like pre-diabetes already. Okay, so much glucose inside your blood that your nephrons cannot keep up and reabsorb, then you'll end up inside your urine. Okay, so here are some samples of questions. Uh, section C, I will not spend time going in depth because this section uh, we've gone through, this will be our third time already. But you are expected to know how the last part of our nephron is able to regulate the amount of water we absorb. Uh, and we've done this twice before, but I put it here so that it reminds you that uh, this is still relevant to this chapter. Okay, this was given as a case study in one of the previous chapters, but now uh, you can tie it into this particular chapter. You could test yourself to see if you understand how the sequence works with this particular sequencing activity. If I'd like to close out the chapter, I hope you managed to visit the NKF booth last week. But I just want to talk a little bit about kidney failure. Thank you. 
that song at that point. Thinking back to if I was 15 again, you know, and what could I have done or what could have been done differently for me or what would have helped me to take note that I could have diabetes? I think it was information. And for the younger ones, especially those with poor um, habits, eating, lack of exercise, um, I think this is a group of, of kids that needed, needs attention. Second, the tubules inside the dialysis machine is also 
kind of permeable. In our nephrons, it has all the membrane transport protein so that we can reabsorb useful stuff. Inside the machine, all these tubes are also semi-permeable so that it can take away all of the nasty stuff that's flowing through our gut. Next, the tubules are actually very long. I don't know if you managed to drop by the booth that day, but they show you a tube with many fibers inside. Yeah, those fibers, are uh, you find millions and millions of those fibers inside one machine, and uh, they pump your blood through those fibers. And those fibers usually is very thin. Uh, in this diagram, they show you very thick fibers, but actually it's not. It's actually very, very, very thin. Uh, this helps to increase surface area much, very much like our own network. All of our tubules are very thin and very long. Next up, we need to be able to have some cleaning fluid. He dies, since machine has a fresh fluid flowing into the machine, and the dirty fluid will come out. We call this fluid dialysis solution. Sorry, dialyzing, so dialyzing solution. And this solution that is going into the machine, you'll find that it has zero waste. It has zero waste so that nutrient, so that the waste from your blood can exit via diffusion into the blood, into the into the solution. Ah, so what is in this solution that is going in? Okay, this solution that is going in. Okay, so we have some solution going in us. Uh, this solution that is going in. What it does have? It has the same concentration of solutes as your blood. That means each machine is kind of tailored to you if you have to go for dialysis. Why must it be the same concentration so that the useful stuff don't leave your, the tubes? We do not want things like glucose to enter the fluid as it is exiting. We don't want it. We want it to stay in your blood. In order to do so, we need this fluid surrounding to be the same concentration as wipers in your blood. So no diffusion will occur. However, what you will find is that you have no metabolic waste product. Because it has no metabolic waste product, all of the metabolic waste will exit. Whereas things like glucose, amino acids, whatnot, it will not exist because the concentration inside and outside is the same. That is our, that is the scientist's smart way la, to prevent useful stuff from exiting, where but the bad stuff will exit. It's just really a play of concentration gradients. The biology concept that you are very much aware of. Yeah, so is it basically Oh, yeah, you're right. Essentially, the dialysis, dialy dialyzing solution that's going in is essentially clean blood, uh, but minus your red blood cells, white blood cells, and all, all that stuff. Okay. The last adaptation of this machine. So if you notice, the blood is flowing in one direction. It's going into the machine via the green arrows you see, and then it goes back to your body. However, the dialyzing fluid, the solution is going in the opposite direction. This tries to mimic a lot of the processes that you find inside your body. We want blood and the solution to go in opposite directions, then we can maintain a concentration gradient. So the blood and the dialyzing solution goes in opposite direction. That helps to maintain a concentration gradient so that constantly waste products will leave your blood and go inside your solution. So here, the dialyzing solution is going this way, whereas your dirty blood is going in opposite direction. Because they go in opposite direction, there will always be a concentration gradient and the waste will always exit at a constant rate. You can describe this as a counter current flow. A counter current means they counter each other as they are flowing. 
this is the last important feature of the machine that we that many many people in Singapore have to use. The machines take up so much space and therefore you can imagine that these machines are also a limited supply. If your family has history of diabetes, actually this is something you want to really take care of because kidney failure is almost usually the next step after diabetes. Uh, I have an uh, uncle who has uh, developed diabetes very, very early in his life and after he got kidney failure. Both kidneys failed, not just one. He was lucky enough to find a donor um, and he, because it's a waiting list, uh, this waiting list uh, requires you not only need your blood type to match and all this stuff before the donation can take place. So he did get a new kidney, just one, uh, but now after many years, even that kidney is failing because of our immune system fighting away this new kidney that he has inserted into the body. Uh, our body, uh, if we try to take in a new organ, it will recognize it as a foreign object. And so actually the immune system is constantly attacking it. Uh, after many years, it will also break down. So now he's at a stage where, because he's really received a kidney once, he's not allowed to receive it one more time. Because you want to give other people priority. So now, he's, all, he's down to a dialysis machine, constantly having to get the blood out and put back in. Uh, it's not, the outlook is not good. Uh. He's been going in and out of the hospital very often. Because our kidneys do more than just filter. It also regulates and carries out homeostasis. That's something the machines cannot do. The machines cannot regulate how much salt or water we want to put through and take in. So three times a week, each session around four hours. That's kind of like you're going for your CCA. Yeah. Three times a week, four hours each time. But imagine sitting there. Uh, but your kidneys are able to carry out its function 24 hours. And this is how much the kidney can filter in one week. 24-7, but the dialysis machine, only this much. 300 liters if you just go these three times four hours. About 10,000 liters your kidneys can do 24-7. Um, so Singapore, uh, if you are not aware, actually all of us, uh, is all our basis, uh, all of us are registered in this human organ uh, what happens is, if you were to pass away and your organs are still healthy, your organs are automatically donated uh, to this pool. So that if anyone needs an organ, it can be, um, you can be part of that waiting list. Uh, so it's on an opt-out basis. When I reach the, the right age, I receive a letter to let me know and that if I want to opt-out, I can opt-out. Uh, but stay in, because honestly, it can help a lot of people, your organs. Uh, I had a family member who... who Okay, so this is my grand-aunt. Uh, my grand-aunt, uh, her son, died at the age of 27. Um, he came home one day, best friend of my father, said he had a headache, uh, went to sleep, next morning he just didn't wake up. Um, and at that time, uh, my grand-aunt decided that she would donate all of his organs away. So his heart went to someone else's body, his kidneys went to someone else's body, uh, his liver went to someone else's body, and to her, in a sense, she feels like her son lives on through three different people. Um, and actually all those people do visit her once in a while because they do treasure the, you know, the second life given to them. And they kind of see her as her second mom now. Yeah, so, um, but organ transplant is not the, something everyone can get access to. It really, prevention is the most important. You have to take care of your kidneys. They're really small but very powerful. Um, because this is not something you want to plug yourself in. Okay, that's all I have for this chapter. I just want you to know one last scary thing. Actually, because it's impossible for someone to keep injecting into you to draw blood out, people have to go for dialysis as a permanent tube that they that's inserted into them. When needed, you open the tube and then you insert needle in to draw blood out. So actually, you can find people you know that they go through dialysis. You see this huge tube that is permanently inserted into your body. Yeah. So take care of yourself, drink lots of water. That's the best way to take care of yourself. And do not take a lot of sugary drinks. Okay? Yeah, look at each other, stare at each other, yeah? Because that is the real killer for all of us. Okay, that's all for today's lesson. Uh, all the best for your chemistry later on. Okay, that's all.
Thank you. All the best for